this is it. Bad news and good. The way to move. From now on, I set myself free of limits and imaginary lines. My own master and absolute. I divest myself of the holes that would hold me. That's what the poet wrote. Being no more modest than immodest, he said, the old man called his own shots. Walt Whitman set it all down more than a hundred years ago in a poem scratched out with quill, pen, and paper called Song of the Open Road. O public road, he wrote, you express me better than I can express myself. Well, now it's my turn. Just moving along, heading south. Interstate 5, Highway 101, El Camino Real out of the pass, the old King's Highway. Down along the California coastline freeway, leading wherever I want to go. Listen, said Walt, I'll be honest with you. I don't offer the old smooth prizes, but offer rough new ones instead. I'm in favor of that, being no more modest than immodest. Rough prizes instead of smooth, whatever happens. My name, James Garner. This is my road, the one I choose, the one I follow. I got up at four o'clock in the morning to do this. My buddy Scooter Patrick and I are Gonna race this Bronco about 850 miles through hot, dry desert mountains, sand, and what have you, all the way from Ensenada to La Paz in Baja, California. We'll be eating dust for about 24 hours and coughing it for about two weeks. If you asked me if I'm a little crazy for doing this, you'd probably get one of these. Uh, ask me if we think we can go down a road quicker than 300 other guys, well, I'd probably say, we're sure as hell gonna find out. Being no more modest than immodest, it's only fair to say that I'm out to win this off-road race to La Paz. We have a team of six cars like the one Scooter and I are driving, entered in a starting lineup of 244, all kinds, including motorcycles. All heading south where the pavement ends, just mixing it up, finding a groove. That's Scooter and me just trying to find which way did they go. It's a lot of fun, but it's dangerous out here, too. You can't let yourself relax. on the way to La Paz or back to Ensenada. Meanwhile, our teammate, Parnelli Jones, in another Bronco, number 83, has a hornet on his tail. And there ain't nothing on this whole desert that's gonna stop that man on his bike from thinking he can catch Parnelli. Over 200 miles into the race now, and Parnelli on the left is running ahead of Scooter and me. That's us way down there on the right, and we got problems. While the rest of the race goes on around us. Fifty miles to go. We have on the charge to send in that checkpoint about 45 miles. Would you believe only 32?
59 again, coming on now, but we're behind. You can really get spread out in this Baja race. And then again, when you're running good like we are now, you just pick them off one at a time. Courteous the way this other car lets us around, right? Well, that's part of it. Fact is, though, there's only room for one car on this road, and if you don't pull over in this mad dash to La Paz, you get run over. This is Checkpoint Santa Inez. Today's population, about a dozen mechanics, 40 airplanes, a couple of thousand gallons of gasoline, a few chickens, and we hope two new tires. Last week, the population was six people and those same chickens. I told you, Scooter, they don't have any tires here. Were you out of tires? Yeah, the two on the back are gone. Now, what you, how long ago was Parnelli here? Uh, about 11.53. An hour and 20 minutes. That's about what we lost. Take it there goes old what's his name an hour and 20 minutes off the pace with a couple of spares that wouldn't hold up a kitty car chase and Farnelli Jones must be some nervy actor a kind of lucky actor though South of Santa Inez, Parnelli is out with a broken front suspension, and he's not alone. Run them till the end is the rule, then run them down the road some more. It's a hell of a long way to La Paz. Baja, California, the long dry boot to the end of the race that'll go from day to night to day again. The broken parts, the dust that gets into every pore, and the tremendous fatigue. But it's worth every cough and bump of it, because now it's just you, the car, and that open road ahead. Have you had your shower, dear? Yeah, oh, I'm clean. Fresh yeah. as a daisy, yeah. just ready to go. Your makeup's running. Is it? Makeup, man. Better We're way behind. We're about uh, two, two and a half hours well, behind what we should be, but we had a little problem. Uh, we had a few little problems. Jim Is it for sure drive. that uh, uh, Bill and Fernelli are out? Bill and Parnelli are out, Loomis is out, and the rest of our boys are going strong. My teammate Larry Miner wins his class, comes in third overall, and first automobile. The end of the race at La Paz. Scooter and I didn't win it, but only three cars in our class got here ahead of us. That's not bad. This is Los Angeles, bench racing time, and time to announce plans. Laying it all on the press, getting everybody up for the coming year. We're going racing on the big circuits. Endurance cars and Formula A cars, this is it, the real thing. What the hell am I getting into? Gentlemen, I think our big announcement today is what we call the Garner TS5. And I'd like to uh, open our little racing establishment formally by uh, showing you our rendering. Cold and wet and half a world away, Silverstone, England. This is our John Surtees Lynn Terry built Formula A car, the TS5 the big test, shakedown time. New design never been raced. This has to be considered a gamble. I'm already on my way to meet Scooter and give her a go. No, this isn't the race car, not quite. But it's about the best way to get out to Silverstone in Scooter's little mini. I'm looking forward to this. It'll be the first time I've had a crack at a Formula car since I made the film Grand Prix. It's a whole new thing happening here, getting ready to do something we wanted to do for a long time. This is John Surtees. While we're on the way out, he and his crew are getting the car ready. Surtees started out racing motorcycles and became a world champion at it. Then he started driving race cars. He took the world's championship there, too. Now, John knows what goes into a performance machine like this one because he's been on all sides of racing. He's a driver, an engineer, and a builder. He's got it all locked up there in his head, and when he's shaking down a race car like he is now, 
he's got kind of a sixth sense working for him. Scooter has it, too. It's no ordinary machine we're dealing with here. We, we deal in limits. We push horsepower and we push metal fatigue, driver fatigue, too. We're on the edge of blowing the whole thing all the time, but I like that. Having what you think is a good idea and then making it work. Pits and Paddock, huh? This place they call Silverstone used to be an airport during World War II. The RAF used it for a fighter base. They had them all over England. And that's why England is kind of the seat of racing now, because when the war was over and everything went for scrap, somebody had the idea of turning these old aerodromes into racetracks. So here we are. Well, the guys are waiting. I better go in and try my uniform on. Uh-oh. We got snow today. That makes it just a little slippery out there. Well, you can consider that one of my better tests. I didn't make a mistake. Before we go racing with the Formula A car we saw in England, we're going to run two English Lola Coupes like this one here in the 24 Hours of Daytona. Now here's your average movie actor taking on the factory teams. Think about it. Today is for qualifying. Tomorrow afternoon, 63 cars will start the race. Scooter Patrick has just qualified our number nine Lola in 10th starting position with an average speed of 120 miles an hour over the 3.8 mile course. That's really moving. That means he has to be doing 190 on the straight. Davy Jordan on the right is Scooter's co-driver. Both from California, their backgrounds are similar, driving winning Porsche race cars. But their styles differ. Davy's methodical, steady. One of the coolest guys I've ever seen in my life. Scooter's a charger, but still in his own way, just as cool. Our main concern in a race of this kind is longevity. How long will our Lolas live? Once the race starts tomorrow, we've got to keep them running for 24 hours straight, 16 hours longer than Alola has run consecutively in the past. It's going to be working together every minute of the race, myself and all the guys. The guy with the glasses is our head mechanic, Pat Fay. Crew chief with the Ford team, first time they won Le Mans. He's a winner. There's a reason for everything Pat does and a reason for the order it's done in. He and his crew now have the number eight Lola ready to qualify. What's happening now? I mean, I mean, what's really happening? There goes a 2,200-pound car with a 160-pound driver sitting in front of an engine that puts out 450 horsepower. And it's sucking up a gallon of gas every time around the course. And the whole damn thing costs about $35,000 just to put it on the track, just to put it out there and run the risk of reducing the entire enterprise to a pile of junk on some turn. I'm scared to death when my drivers are on the course. Not, not because of the car, but because of them, of their safety. You have to have a cool that won't budge. Now, Don Rabbit has it. He's our team manager. His side of racing doesn't have a steering wheel, but he's a winner. He's a politician, a PR man, an analyst. When the guys discuss gear ratios and performance factors, Don knows what they're talking about, and then I'll tell you. 
Once you get this active technical world in your blood, once the excitement bug is bit, you got to hold on racing. Either, either we lower or we raise second gear. We can get up a little further. I know. Well, that's all it's all. all I'm getting is all I'm getting you know, is I, I said the second gear, you're in there for five seconds, right? And then that's when it. you shift, you drop so far that you that's haven't right. done anything. But that's the only change. You got too much room between second and third? Is that what you're the problem is? Yeah, the gap, you know. Yeah. It just, third and fourth are... are you got to wind the hell out of really? second gear to pick up in third. Yeah. Our other two drivers, teammates on the number eight Lola. On the right, Lothar Matzenbacher, German-born American, an ex-Mercedes repairman, Teutonic, quick-tempered, the all-out racer. And Ed Leslie from California, an old pro with all his faculties we have it in one bag. Ed Leslie is at his peak because he's experienced literally everything in racing. He isn't psyched by tomorrow's competition. He knows who they are and what they're up to. The blue and orange bids from Ford of England, the expensive GT40s, Le Mans winners, proven endurance machines. Another major threat, another Lola, brand new, not last year's like ours. Roger Penske's number six, driven by two of the best, Mark Donahue and Chuck Parsons. Lighter and faster than the other Lolas, but is it as durable? And the impeccable German factory entries, the Porsche Model 908 prototype, five of them. Drop third gear in one of the cars. Got to change shifting it. fork, bro. Shifting fork. Oh, how does that? Change that step. A little fast, fast here. This is Davy Hobbs of England, driving a GT40 tomorrow and a Surtees Formula A car later in the season. He's a strong competitor who might win, and a damn good friend too. They're yeah, they, stable. They're real yeah, steady. They are. Right, you see that Porsche, 51, old Mazetta. Yeah. See, better one down here. Yeah. Probably just going to wipe it all up. The number eight car has qualified right behind our number nine in 11th place on Saturday's starting grid. We've run slower than we had hoped, so we're tomorrow's underdogs. But qualification time isn't everything. What really counts is how long can you go without breaking down? Before the race this afternoon and tonight, power plants and gears will be changed in most of the competing cars. High-speed engines used to grab a top qualifying time are yanked out. And slower, more durable engines at $5,000 apiece are bolted in for the 24-hour grind. At Daytona, you really have two races, one for the starting lineup, another for the main go. Most of these men spend the better part of their lives in a garage, and some of them say this is where the real racing goes on, just getting ready for it all, working with your hands and talking it out. If we run... 62, 6300, right? And it's running 202, 203. Mm -hmm. And you start, Flat. you know, giving us the go ahead. And I come by with a thumb down. That means that's what we can do at 62 well, or 6300. Now, if they want to go quicker, we're going to have to turn them more or something. How do you go quicker? That's on everybody's mind tonight. How to go quicker and still have your car live for 24 hours? The Porsche factory team thinks it has the answer but nobody's gonna steal it. It's built into the cars, locked in there behind hard, polished metal. In another garage, Roger Pinsky thinks he has the answer, too. His number six Lola seems to have everyone guessing. It's something like looking horses in the eye and trying to pick a winner. Better forget it and go to bed. Race day, Saturday. The preamble to the 24 hours of Daytona, Florida style. 126 drivers, 63 cars, over $2 million in machinery on the grid. The Porsches, eight factory entries, including their GT cars. And the Alphas, the Fords, Pontiacs, Chevrolets, Ferraris, and the Lolas, our Lolas and our drivers. Scooter and Davey, Lotar and Ed, ready to get it on. And what they call that super calm pre-race talk. Like hell. I never been so nervous in my life. Owner nerves. Put me in a car, I'd calm down in a hurry. Because that's where it's really happening. I've been behind the wheel, and for race watching, it's the best seat in the house. Right, to wipe that rear window. It gets dirty, it gets really yeah. cruddy. With no, it it'll be white. Yeah. It's it'll as be important white. as the front one. Okay, very good. Are you, are you gonna use the left turn indicator if you wanna come in or something? Okay. Or I'll drop down too. 
Yeah. Okay. If it happens after there. Yeah, after have to there. Yeah. Down. Right. Okay. Well, this is it. Over five dozen cars starting the pace lap. The slowest in the back, the fastest up front. It's three o'clock now. The race won't end till this time tomorrow. It's going to start with a pole position factory Porsche, and on the outside, Penske's Lola. We're ten cars back, side by side. Competition in the first hour, the Ford GT40, sweet and strong. Another Lola, fast Swiss entry. The Corvettes and other American makes, and Penske's number six, already having the first of its problems with a faulty fuel tank. And all of them, including ourselves, watching the Porsches stretch out the lead with something like 23 hours to go. But we've got a game plan. That's hold on to it. Don't try to win in the first few hours and wait for the other guys to break. roll off and the cars drop out. Broken suspension, blown engines, metal fatigue. And along about sundown, the word is that exhaust fumes are seeping into the Porsche cockpits and their drivers are getting groggy. We're still holding on with our Lolas, back about 10 cars or so, just waiting. And the race isn't even half over yet. It's two in the morning, the 11th hour of the race, and we've already set a record. No Lola has ever gone this long before. Damn it. An unscheduled pit stop for a number eight car. Radiator. Let's get it off. Get the spare radiator out of the truck. Somebody get Ed and look at something. We're right? still in front, but they're starting to drop out. This is Lola's in every 45 minutes. For where, where's the time? 156. Yeah. That's fourth place, baby. He's starting to really let it hang get out. It get it up a little higher. Get it up here. Have that hose. Come on. Load tire ready? Hey, is load tire ready? Hold on. Hold on. Let me check out. Load tire's ready. Let's go. It's dawn, and only half of the starters are still running. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Within the next few laps, all the prototype Porsches and the four GT40s will be out of the race. But both our Lolas are still running strong. They're only coming in now for routine fueling and driver changes. God knows how many hours we've been up. Everybody's nerves are as tight as they're ever going to be. We'll finish this race if it kills us all. Do one thing and do the other. Yeah. No, but not, no, yeah, but I told you then. But it takes more three men. I'm out here. I can do anything. That's old Air Force regulation. Never obey till you get the conflicting order. Men get worn, used up. They, they break, they get fixed. Cars break, men try to fix them. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. It's the old endurance game. We're playing survival here, that's all. With the Porsche 908s and the GT40s out, Penske's Lola has gone to the front. Low tires in second place and scooters in seventh after a two and a half hour pit stop last night to repair a wheel. Penske's Lola is having trouble, but he's still running ahead at the 2300 mile mark. Compared to the other cars, Scooter and Lothar are in good shape. But still, to finish, they have to know exactly how far they can push them. No more, no less. And in the 24th hour, we know our game plan works. Minus one. We get a second place. It's Chuck Parsons in car number... 
number six, the winner of the 24 Hours of Daytona. And in seventh place, the checkered flag goes to Scooter Patrick, driving James Garner Lola number nine. The other Garner entry with Lorar Matzenbacher ends the 24 Hours in second place. Going for a bust, all right. We made it. Over 2,300 miles in 24 hours. That's pretty good, I'd say, against the big factory boys. Scooter and Davey in the nine car. They're coming in now, low tar in our number eight Lola. You get an idea, and you make it work. That's what it's really all about. Get in, Hey, where's that? <laughs> oh, here, here. Oh, yeah. boy, we had you with hey, low tide. Beautiful, baby. Just beautiful. Oh. There's a job there, Nothing huh? Nothing to it. Nothing to it, Lothar says. Not much. Sleep One of the reasons for in Sebring, Florida, is a curiosity left over from the past. It's an old airstrip with a new sound. Okay. This is what Scooter sees during practice in the Lola, an airport course that'll tear the guts out of a car. No easy banking like Daytona, just flat turns, suspension killers. Twelve of them every time around the 5.2-mile course. But the team's ready for a win. Daytona proved that. Racing for 12 hours instead of 24, our cars will only have to live half as long to be competitive. And we're either going to be competitive at Sebring or get out of town. I can't keep water in that basket. I, I put the thing on it all night. Wash your fingers. Yeah. Scooter's on it, though. I was actually working. I actually was going to ask you where you have your right height set. As high as I can get it. Scooter in number 10. This was the number 9 car a month ago at Daytona. It's been running a little warm, but this is minor right now. There's a bigger problem. Lothar hasn't come by. He's stuck out on the course somewhere in the other car. Where's Lothar, Scooter? Lothar is on the... Uh, you know where you go down the back over here, Ed? And you make the big sweeper to the 90 on the back. He's about 100 feet this side of the 90. If you want me to keep it under 7,000, just put a sticker on the damn windshield. That was my understanding. That's what the instructions were supposed to have been for all the drivers to run 7,000 hours. Last guy. Art, Art Early said at 72, 74. You can do it once in a while, but you can't do it consistently. Well, we weren't. We weren't pulling in fifth gear. It's 7,100. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, the reason Don Rabbit's chewing Lothar's butt is because his engine is a total wipeout. It just won't go as fast as Lothar tried to make it go. So, in goes a new one at five grand. A quarter inch, just. Right up to where it's There's a groove you have to find, and Lothar was looking for it like any other driver. That's the big test for him and Ed. At Sebring, you have to rev your engine faster. The course is a series of drag strips, acceleration runs. It's one of the things you put into an equation that is supposed to make everything work in your favor. It just doesn't always happen. Pick up some braking, man. That's where we can make it. You know, just to get a... 69 or 7 instead of 71, 72. You run in fourth gear up around 1 and 2. No, I run fifth through 1, and then click it down to the next for, for 2, and then stay in there, and then come third to go around that thing, then nail fourth, going to the MG, then back to third and around, and then under the bridge, I get fourth and I stay it in fourth. I don't go to fifth. Yeah. Everything we do here on practice and qualifying day goes toward getting in shape for tomorrow's race. And while we're fixing low tire and scooters, Lola, Davy Jordan, Mr. Cool, showing about as much emotion as a man sitting down to a plate of fried eggs in the morning, gets ready to turn it on in practice. 
So, in the meantime, I just stick it out in the pits and do my thing. A little pre-race racing with the boys, if you haven't already recognized him. That's Mario Andretti on the left and Chris Amon standing next to him. There's going to be some pretty heavy competition here at Sebring. You can bet on that. Like Daytona, the 12 hours of endurance at Sebring tomorrow will be part of the manufacturer's championship circuit. And a lot of the same cars are back in this major event before Le Mans. The Fords, this GT40 driven by Jackie Ickes and Jackie Oliver. The winning number six at Daytona is now number nine. The Penske Lola driven by Mark Donahue in the center next to Roger Penske. His co-driver will be Ronnie Bucknam. Their Lola, like ours, has had a complete rebuild since Daytona. Stiffer suspension, lower gears, faster engine. The Ferrari factory who didn't make it to Daytona is here with one entry, Model 312. Driven by Mario Andretti and Chris Amon. And the Porsche 908s are back. Open roadsters this time to beat the heat and exhaust fumes. Modified hill climb cars called Sebring Spiders. Everybody's ready for tomorrow's race. Well, this is race morning for Scooter and his wife. He's just going over the track to drive his race car. Another work day. Davy Jordan's already there, boning up on a driver's meeting so his partner could sleep late, since Scooter will be taking the first turn at the wheel when the race starts at 11. Chris Amon has the new lap record set yesterday in the full starting position for his factory Ferrari. But before that, for an entire year, Scooter had the record. He knows the course and how to handle himself on it. It's like coming home again at Sebring. It's that very peculiar time in racing. Half an hour to go. Time for seeing your old buddies, for idle talk, race strategy. A little good distraction. The rules, regulation, and codes of conduct in this particular world along the pit wall. Push it back. Push it back. Yeah, I know. I fell clear into the car here that year. Ran all the way across as fast as I could with other souls and slid right underneath the car. <laughs>
get ready to change. You might say at this point that Scooter's overheated car has had it. Only 45 minutes into the race. A steam wagon nobody knows how to fix. for two and a half hours, then took the walk they're taking now. But Lotar and Ed's car is still in there, our Lola number 11, with 10 hours to go, running in 10th place and moving up one car every hour. The Ferrari's overheating, the Alphas are all gone. The tightly sprung Porsches are beginning to break up on the bumpy course. So is Pinsky's Lola. Based on that, you figure out our chances. gas keeps us in the race for about 70 minutes. Then it's into the pits again for more fuel and a driver change and new tires if we need them. A little sticky for a cross-country drive, but we don't get very excited about economy around here. It's how fast you go, not what it costs to get there. The only reason we want to know gas mileage is to time our next pit stop. We figure out our gas mileage from this. Scooter only got four to practice. Huh? Scooter only got four to I'm standing here on the sidelines watching these cars, and I say, God, they are so fast and so beautiful. And I'm thinking about what gets somebody started in this thing, what got me started, finding a completely different group of people than I'd imagined. Maybe the risk element does it, tweaking our taste buds, so to speak. Whatever it is, it's wrong to try to analyze it. As long as it feels right, don't inquire. If you do, you'll ruin something. It's an entire language all its own. And you can be fluent without even being aware of it. Oh, that was fun. It was good. You were going, you were turning some pretty good times when you were trying to stay in front of him. Yeah, I got down to nine. I got down to nine, which yeah, is, I know. that's good for me. Very Not good. good for Fred, but good for me. Yeah. But, uh, Now, what Dick Smothers and I get out of racing and what some little girl gets out of it isn't to be argued. But when a team of female drivers run out of gas on the Seabing Strait, then I have to butt in and say it's taking just a little too much for granted to think you're going to ease that baby back into traffic. By now, old Pinsky's Lola is leading again. But on the 96th lap, not too long from now, the car that won Daytona will have to retire at Sebring with broken suspension. In the meantime, we're still picking off a car an hour, moving in on sixth place. It feels right now for Ed and Lothar. They've got a hold on an international endurance event, competing against the finest drivers and machinery in the world. But we're only running two races in this series of 10, Daytona and here. We're not out for the championship, for the big prize like Porsche or Ferrari or some other manufacturer. Ed and Lothar, they're just doing real good what they know how to do best. And it's pleasing the living hell out of them. Well, they getting you way down there by your ankles. <laughs>
minutes to go, so fill it all the way, huh? Ed, you're running third behind the Ferrari to four. Now, let's keep it going. Just keep it going. All the way, we need every, every gallon. Goodyear says the tires will go all the way. No sweat. This way, it'll, it'll pull you right off the road, won't it? No, I don't think I could drive it unless I didn't use the brakes at all. I see. It just started grinding. We've been in 15 minutes already. How much longer, huh? Well, Ferrari's number one. Ford just moved into third. We're down to fourth on the board. It's on there solid. I gotta cool it down and get it off. name won't be in lights much longer. It's all here on Ed's face. Everything that's happened in the last 32 minutes. That's how long we've been in the pits. We could have won. We were on to something good. But now, we'll only finish in sixth place. Symbols. We're... you ever want to do is let a race get you down. Since Sebring, I've been to Europe, made a film, got myself shaved, and I feel a lot better. My driver's been busy, too. Uh, Lothar Matzenbacher has been racing Formula A cars, uh, Can-Am, and Trans-Am, too, with Ed Leslie. And Scooter Patrick's been racing and winning. And John Surtees has the open-wheel cars that we saw in England running like a bandit on the American circuit. They won a championship race up in uh, Minnesota with Davey Hobbs driving. You remember Davey, Daytona? Well, we've got one of the Formula A cars now for ourselves, and Scooter's been testing it at a track about an hour north of San Francisco called Sears Point International Raceway. It's hilly country like Western Connecticut. That's where our first race will be next week. We got a lot of work. The car is only about half finished, Scooter tells me. It has to be gone through and set up just right, like a fine watch with a 450 horsepower spring. Not many people around today, so we have the track to ourselves. Scooter in the new formula car and our mechanics, the best I know. Max Kelly, our crew chief, and little Bobby Fischetti with the goatee, ready to try out our new toy. When you get on it, watch the back end. It wants to come around on you all the time. The suspension is still tricky as hell. getting to do what I couldn't do in England, drive the new Formula car. Formula A is a whole new thing in American racing. You probably best describe it as our version of racing for the world's championship for Formula One. These cars are a little bigger than Europe's Formula One cars, more horsepower, but less expensive. It's a 200 mile an hour rig with the right gears, but we're not going to go that fast. About 170 top, I'd say, on a road circuit like this. The car has a monocoque construction. Body, gas tanks, and frame are all in one. The engine, like our Lola's had, is a Traco-built Chevy. Scooter's right about the handling. Our mechanics, Max and Bobby, have a lot to do in the next couple of days before Connecticut. American Airlines Flight 640, nonstop to Hartford, Connecticut, is now in the final... Well, being no more modest than immodest, it's a pretty gutsy thing we're doing getting into competition this late in the season, and Scooter's never even driven an open wheeler in a race. What was it I said? 
we're sure as hell going to find out. Is uh, Mr. Patrick aboard now? Yes, he just boarded a couple minutes ago. Kill him a ticket. Thought you weren't going to make it. Saved the window for you, though. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you feel like you've been here before? I almost feel like I haven't left. I'll tell you, Max called me at 3.30 this morning. And I guess when they stopped for coffee, they uh, decided they checked... Scooter's talking about Max Kelly, well, our super chief mechanic on the Formula A car, who's been working literally day and night ever since our Sears Point testing. The only rest that he and Bobby Fischetti and their families will get is right now, hauling the race car cross-country with the van and trailer. We'll all get to Lime Rock, that's the track in Connecticut, just in time to qualify the new car, maybe. It's a one-day race. I know it. We're running out of time, that's what we're doing. We get one hour of practice, and if anything goes wrong in practice, you know, uh, how much sorting out can we do? How many hours does it take to sort out a car? Well, you know, if we're lucky, I'd say it's going to take at least a day if we're really lucky and everything goes right. Well, I think what we are trying to tell me is we're going to use Lime Rock as a test and we'll go racing at San Javi. I think so. Now, from up here in this big remote airplane, miles above everything, going 600 miles an hour, Scooter and I can only guess what the guys are doing down there on that long open road of theirs. Stopping for a gourmet dinner, checking into a nice motel, jumping into the swimming pool. That's the beautiful part of racing. All that opportunity to see new, exciting, glamorous places. I bet right now Max and Bobby are being waited on by some gorgeous young thing, eating cake and ice cream, and ready to get a move on again, going across country to Lime Rock, Connecticut. Well, they deserve every bit of their luxury. Race day is going to be a hell of a test for everybody. It takes a long time to learn what you want to know about a race car before putting a driver in it and saying, OK, Scoot, all the pieces are in place. Go do it. That's a long road, a long, long one. Having a nice cold lunch, you know. <laughs> no, no, I'm hearing this. In the humidity so bad you don't believe it. Changing fire. These are the Litchfield Hills of northwestern Connecticut. Most of the time, the grass here is just full of bugs, but on race day, it gets full of people, too. People watching other people driving. Here's our boy Davey Hobbs again. We'll be seeing a lot of him in the next few weeks. This fella is Andrea Diotomic, Davy's teammate on the two Surtees cars, number 74 and 75. A lot like ours, but we don't have airfoils. And this is the Lime Rock course, a beauty. One and a half miles around. The race this afternoon will be 70 laps. The average speed, just a little over 100 miles an hour. 20 cars will start, and 63 minutes later, it'll all be over. We're latecomers, but for most of the other drivers, the race at Lime Rock will be their 10th in a series of 13, the Continental Championship for Formula A cars. The drivers are from the United States, Canada, Germany, and Italy, and like David Hobbs, from England. A couple of months back, we had Davey lined up to drive for us when we were planning a three-car team. Then something happens, things get changed around, same in racing as in anything else. Now we got one car, one driver, still a lot of headaches, and a lot of good friends. You don't need anything else to go racing except maybe a ton of money. And an open road ahead for Scooter for qualifying time at Lime Rock.
Old Scoot's putting it on here, but he's still five seconds off the pace. Two reasons, sloppy suspension, slowing him in the turns, and because we haven't put on the airfoils, or wings, as spectators call them. Now, if I seem nervous as hell here, I am. While I've been talking, Scooter hasn't come around. Something tells me he's out there on the backstretch with a broken race car. This is what I can really do without. Trudging over a mountain and knowing there's nothing but bad news on the other side. Look, there's James Garner. Where? Over there. Oh, oh what's his autograph? Got a pen? <laughs> 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 James Garner's entry, first time out this year in our Continental Get Championship. Up. Scooter Patrick's driving a TS-5. He's from Manhattan Beach, California. What happened? I think the uh, distributor shaft We'll get a tow truck to pull you in. Practice is about uh, anywhere from five to ten minutes before it'll be over. We'll search up a distributor. I hear you got a Kilburn uh, distributor uh, complete outfit, right? Yeah. Goes into a Lucas injector. We want to borrow that, Sparky. The real fun starts now. Without the distributor, that one broken part, the Scooter's car isn't going to start again. It's either put in a new one or pull out of the race. And price tag, $2,000. I give you a diner's club credit card. Think that satisfying? <laughs> uh, I'm giving personal check. I'll give him, uh, you know, like whatever he wants. If I have to sell my body. This is all Bobby Fischetti needs. Along with the heat, another problem, another delay. And we still haven't qualified the car. Poor old Bobby. I mean, the guy is just falling down on his feet. The sun is killing him. He hasn't had any sleep. We didn't go to bed last night at all. We come out and look at all the exotic stuff that everybody's got on theirs. Ours is, has nothing but the engine. And we're trying to work with a suspension. And we work on a basic suspension. And it's running. According to plan, everybody should have been about four laps into the race by now, but lucky for us, there's been a delay, a postponement. Now, if we can just get this engine running in the next few minutes, we'll be able to start, even though we didn't qualify. Everybody's pitched in to help, even guys from another pit. But it's that broken gas pump over there that's really saving us, keeping most of the other cars still waiting for fuel. Around six... We continue now with more of James Garner in the racing scene. You know we're going to make the race now. The one out there on the track that was supposed to start at 3.45 and it's now already 4. But the real race has been going on for a long time, the race to get ready. Max Kelly calls it massaging a car, working with it until it's as finely tuned as he knows how to make it. He's an artist who's finished his job just to hand it over to another artist, the driver, to Scooter. It's like giving a painter a superb brush and pigment and then seeing him go on and do something wise and beautiful with it beyond that. And most of the spectators viewing this whole thing see something entirely different. So who, in the end, can really say what the big draw is to racing? Who even wants to guess? Not me. I just know that right this minute, my driver, Scooter Patrick, in car number 30, is moving under his own power. Lining up in back of the pack where they send all the did not qualifies like tardy school kids. And we're so far from perfect. Brand new tires that haven't been scrubbed in yet. No airfoil sticking up high to hold the back end down on turns. Suspension's still not the way we want it, but... Well, as I said before, didn't I, uh, we're sure as hell gonna find out? running out to see what's the matter. It never happened like this in Grand Prix by George, did it? Well, it's gonna start, it's gonna fire. So Scooter is off in the Garner number 30, and this is going to give Scooter a little job to do. Remember him from the West Coast has uh, come up in the Porsches, but a very fine Porsche driver. And the rest of the pack now, the pace car leading them down the main straight to the start, Posey on the pole, the Otovich on the outside, Hobbs and Winterstein, the second row qualifiers. Out 
The pace lap is over, and everybody's got the green flag for go, everybody except Scooter. 37 seconds behind, four and on now to catch up with the rest, to get his own flag. Three quarters of a mile behind the leader, Andrea Diadamich. Come on, Scooter, let's get it on. There comes Scooter, the green flag for him, really out to catch the rest of them. Diadamich taking the lead, Posey second, Winterstein third, and it's Davey Hobbs fourth. Five cars, David Hobbs. He was third on the starting grid with a qualifying speed of 105 miles an hour. But Scooter, even without the airfoil, is turning it on. Already passing slower cars. Seven seconds, 56, 57 again, and 55. Feeling out the car and finding his own groove. No question about it, Formula A is tough to handle. The cars are light, the weight's in the rear, and by the time you feel the back swinging around, it's usually too late to do anything about it. It's all finesse and artwork, like driving Grand Prix cars. And world champion Graham Hill pinned it down when he said, we're executing a very fine balancing act on the edge of disaster. Superstitious, that's lap 13. The race continues as the cars bunch up, but no passing will be allowed until the course is clear to the ambulance. It gives the other drivers time to think a little bit about this game. So far, four cars are out of the running with 17 still in. And by lap 27, old Scoot the Charger will have moved from last up to 11th place. Get the engine in time. Yeah. Yeah, we got to find an engine somewhere in Hartford. Right. We and hope so it's in Hartford. Well, today is the end of Labor Day. So if we can put it in and have enough time to really track the suspension, all right, and know exactly where we are, and go out. 
Now, right here, this is what's so beautiful about Scooter. He's blown the engine and the race, right? But he's not rattled by it. It happened. It's done. He's already talking about the car and what's wrong with it and what we can do in less than a week to make it better. He's got a savvy about the guts of a race car damn few drivers have. Scooter's nerve ends get down into every part of the car, and he can feel the whole thing all the time. That's where it's at. That's a real race driver. Right, now, look, we got a lot of stuff in the rear that's bad that we know that's sloppy, okay? We do. We could go, when we get on the brakes, we could go to a super toe out. And we could, or toe in on the brakes, and on acceleration, we'll just walk them out like this, and that thing will just, it'll, we try to get on it, it'll, it'll like walk. This. And that's what it's doing. It's, it's always do the same thing, though? Well, the harder you run it, the harder we've been able to run it, the more rubber we've been able to make it stick, which makes everything work harder, the more this walking shows up. Sure. See, sure. it's getting... That's when you got to get all those joints just dead tight and clean. Yeah. And so we're stuck. You know, we're, that's step one. <laughs> us sitting in the van, we've pretty much forgotten about the race outside, but it's still going strong. In car number one, the leader, Sam Posey, has been losing one second a lap to George Winterstein in car number 12. Winterstein's out to take it all. I got him a little water here anyway. We got a lot to fight at the next race next week in Canada. Sam's going to be there. That's for openers. And he's hard to beat. All of them are. George, <laughs> nice. Well, like we said, Lime Rock will be for testing. We'll go racing at San Javit in Canada. But first, I'm going to fly back out west and get us a new engine. Then I'm going to get away by myself for a day out in the open. Put a steering wheel in my hands again. Dust bunnies under the chair. Dust. Track, you know, reasonably early, about 10 o'clock, and we have a warm-up session for the feature cars. We're going to wander around, meet the drivers, meet the various groups. Uh, there'll be a lot of press photographers out there. They'll want to get pictures of you and the car and poses probably with the drivers, etc. And then the biggest thing that you'll probably be doing with the crowd... This is a Friday night in San Javit, Canada, about 100 miles out of Montreal. The gentleman is one of the racetrack owners. The young lady is Mike and Cruz, Miss Continental Racing Queen. 
You won't see Scooter and me here. We rolled in kind of early. Been working on the car to get it ready for practice and qualifying tomorrow and for the race on Sunday. But instead of another garage, I wanted you to have a little party time with our queen and some of the racing people. I see Lotar and Max in the back there. Well, we're going to have a little party of our own tomorrow out there on the racetrack. It's a good course. It's the same place they run the Canadian Grand Prix. There's an old saying in racing that if you haven't spun out on a corner, you haven't been around it fast enough. Well, Scooter got off the course on the other side and some of the rough stuff, and from the smell of things, something must have punctured his gas tank. Now we've only got just a few minutes left to qualify. You've heard that one before, right? So it's time to improvise, and improvise damn fast. Funny how everybody in our pit starts chewing gum at the same time. Uh, that's not all gas there, that's water running over it as a safety precaution. You know, when you're racing, we don't have much time to look around and see what the country's like, but there's a different feel here at San Jovite. It's like European racing. Scooter feels it, we all do. The French-English PA announcements, the girls, the enclosed pits, and the track itself. They call it Le Circuit Montremblant. Two and one half miles of some of the best road racing course in the world. In other words, it's a place where a driver can really prove himself. He's got to be good here. Qualifying's done. Davy Hobbs has ended up with a pole position. Sam Posey next to him. Lotar got sixth and Andrea tenth. Winterstein eleventh and we're starting in sixteenth position out of a field of 27 cars. 142 flat. 142 flat. Four and a half seconds slower than Posey's time. We think we can make up that difference with the airfoil. We're going to get to a race in time, you know that? It's a good thing we had some bubble gum. Stuff up that tank, we wouldn't have made it, right? That's Dickie Smothers I'm talking to inside the helmet. A smaller car than ours, but it's a fast one. Dickie knows all about it. How many turns are there? You don't know yet? Why don't, you, why don't you take a little time and count, Dickie? With only eight laps, just don't go so hard, you know? Yeah. You remember real good. Do like you, you said, you know? Just keep going deep. Because you can't see, right? I can't think either. Hey, I'm going to have to 
off the shuttle lanes and warm it up. Start it. I hope it's better. Well, we got the way around. San Javid is probably the most difficult uh, track on the whole circuit, and I don't know it very well, as I told Jim, but get in the car with me and we'll try to learn it together. Here we are going to the, uh, the south sweeper. I'm doing 120, breaking down to about 60 or 70, holding the car to the right side of the track and accelerating as fast as I can in third gear. Now I'm going to be shifting to fourth and then into fifth and eventually hit about 130 at the end of the straight. Now I'm cresting a hill. The car gets very light, so you have to keep it straight ahead or you could get sideways. Now I'll break down and do about 70 miles an hour in third gear through this right-hander. Now braking, get on the gas. Now I'm accelerating and coming down into second for this left-hander, and accelerating out in second gear very fast, on the brakes, now holding the car away from the turn to the last moment, and then flipping that curve, being careful not to scrub the tire on that, because it throws you a little sideways. Now I'm accelerating down a hill into a difficult, short, tight sweeper, and I gotta get second gear on the brake, now on the gas, just feathering it enough to keep the car going as fast as possible without going off to the left side of the track. Now I'm entering the start-finish straight now, and we'll go around another time. Uh, you know, I just lost my oil pressure, which seems to happen to me quite a lot. I don't know why, but uh, I guess I'm just lucky. My hand is up to warn the other drivers that I am coasting to a stop now. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous track because as you see on the left, the guardrails, and on the right is the mountainside. And if you do go off the car, you're not so worried about yourself, but the car does get severely damaged. Well, I guess I've got to make that long walk back to the pits wearing my very popular and very well-known broken race car hat. I'd like to throw that one away, I'll tell you. I might look happy here, but in all actuality, I'm very depressed and I, I feel very unhappy. But I'm in the sport for better or for worse, and I guess you just can't cry over spilt motor oil. But it's a brand new engine right down the tubes. I find that the greatest... Uh Quarter to seven, time to go racing. And in another room, Mike and Cruz, the race queen, time to go racing, quarter to seven. pressure on a tire. On the tire itself, Instead of yeah. the tire getting light, it's going to keep it on a wheel. <laughs> but you're wearing it on the inside of the, the squat, you know? Well, yeah, you get it. on it. We give them a whole bag of tricks now. On goes the airfoil. And off, we hope, come about four or five seconds a lap. And we raise the right height to get rid of some of that squat. Right. In other words, we're either going to be completely out to lunch or we might be fairly close. Maybe you should try a little warm-up session yourself with Scooter at the wheel, huh?
picketer watched that wave yellow flag. As you know, it's a Trans Am under a wave yellow flag. Some of the drivers did not pay attention to it. We had nine cars piled up. A wave yellow flag means be prepared to stop, and I mean stop, not slow down. Watch the mirrors constantly on this course. It is ultimately important that you do that. The leaders will be passing the slower cars probably five or six times during the race. And we want to make sure that they get around those cars as fast as possible. Gentlemen, that's about all I have to say for now. Gentlemen, have a good race. Okay, this is it now. And you saw in the warm-up session what Scooter was doing. The car is really sorted out now. And let me tell you, we are competitive. We got the five seconds we were looking for. Still running that pump? debris, heavenly blue tires, and was driven off the track and into the fence. 
I think, all right, it's part of front of All right, every, oh, it's, everything's in one piece. All right, all the wheels are on it. Uh, the tub right here, above the tub, is folded down, all right, a little bit. What happened is um, a tree stump that was holding a fence came right across the cockpit, my head in the cockpit, all right? That's nice. It was kind of cute for a minute, because I had this fence. I'm all right, baby. I had all of this uh, fence hanging over me and this thing jamming me down the cockpit. I couldn't, I couldn't push my way out. I couldn't push my way out of it. But the thing that scared me was that they had a, the, the guy that lit right behind me, George, who started it, lit right behind me and he was on fire. Yeah. And I was, you know, get out of that. Hey, Scoots, go over and get checked up. We'll give you those cars again. Now, this is unofficial. Car number 30, Scooter Patrick. All right, let's, let's, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I didn't see it. But I guess it's six to seven cars gone off together. Eight. Eight gone off together. See that bump? So, uh, I think that, you know, I hope no one was hurt, obviously, but it just so happens I made a good start with Mars in front at the halfway through the first lap. <laughs> bit aggravating. Never mind, David. Say the least. You know how to do it now. But, uh, it's a bad corner to go off this one. I was in the pits when it happened with Don, Max, Bobby, and the others. I heard the sound and saw the smoke above the trees. Then didn't hear anything except the loudspeakers. I was sick. I wanted to throw up. I could see the turn where it happened in my mind. I could see it all in my mind. As I've seen this kind of thing before where men get killed. No one died here, but this is what it looks like when they do. It's something you don't ever want to remember, but you can never forget it. Scooter got banged up. George Winterstein broke a leg in two places. He told me later that it only his thumb hurt. He broke it too, I guess. And then there was the terrible expense of it all. Somebody said $300,000. I don't know, really. It's hard to make a guess. And you can never add up all the hours of effort lost. You never get them back. The only thing is to say that you'll do it over and it'll all be new again the way it was. An hour after the accident, the race is restarted with 20 cars this time instead of 27. I don't need to tell you, we didn't make the grid. The northern day is short, it'll be dark soon, and the forecast is rain. Davy Hobbs goes into the lead right off ahead of Sam Posey, but Sam, who won at Lime Rock, drops out with transmission trouble. Three laps later, the storm that had hit Montreal earlier in the day comes to San Jovi. I've seen it come down like this in Europe during a race. I've driven in it, and it's hell. You can't see, you can't feel the track. All you can do is go slow until it lets up and dries off a little. A lot of the spectators and campers have already started home. The pits are quiet. Everybody is cold and wet. And as the race goes on, one by one, the drivers involved in the accident are asked by the track officials, what happened? As we crested the hill, I saw George come back through the pack, this way, <laughs> going to the right. Okay, ahead of me, yeah, like okay, four or five cars ahead of me. And coming through like this, to and hit he went, the right guardrail. He didn't hit the guardrail. No. He stayed on the track about three quarters of the way to the track and then came right back through the pack, hit the guardrail, went up, and then came across and ended up Gives the guardrail right. on the right-hand side.
Continental Championship in San Javid is over. Andrea takes second. Davy Hobbs wins it. And we were real lucky here that Scooter and the other guys came out of it all right.